we're back now. This is um, going to be part six of, I think it is going to be seven. So this will be part six or seven. And we just finished up with um, um, economics as an object of the, of the social contract. So the the next two sections, which we will, we will, we will be able to do um, in this video, um, is a generalized form of strong federalism um, and zero, zero back. So, the generalized form of strong federalism is referring to the fact that um, that this is, this is a generalized form of the federalism of Madison and Hamilton. Um, probably more uh, Hamilton's version of federalism. So, um, this is a generalized form of something like Hamilton's federalism. And so, in that context, we're going to be looking at how this would play in a global law so of course there is that problem that um, you know of uh, legal legal plurality um, so we're going to talk about that here sovereignty legal plurality wow um, we're going to talk about that here so here we go and I will uh, read from this and give you my commentary as usual and here we go um, a second and equally daunting challenge for any global governance proposition is how does one formulate such a scheme? With all the constraints discussed in this larger work, such that disparate nations insisting on their own sovereignty will ratify and abide such an agreement? This question is also non-trivial, non and until now never solved. Framed another way, we are asking how does one transform a special federalist system, one in one way or another predicated on some kind of ideology limited to national application and unique to a society or culture, into a truly general program tolerant and inclusive of any ideology, among many other things. So, framed another way, we are asking how does one transform a special federalist system into a truly general program tolerant and inclusive of any ideology, among many other things. This discussion necessarily begins with the problem of sovereignty and how a general solution can render a union immune to the same and remove sovereignty as a means of denial of union. This approach, the general federalist approach, is referred to by academics as constitutional pluralism. In order to answer this question, it might be helpful to better understand what role sovereignty plays here. In particular, situations of competition and interdependence are relevant because they potentially threaten state survival. In these two types of situations, seven uses of sovereignty are distinguished. Sovereignty is probably best understood as political power that originated from a fairly geographically homogeneous distribution of power. Over time, due to competition, this power accreted both in strength and geography to power centers. As those power centers grew, they eventually came into contact with other power centers. At times, these power centers would go to war, but in all cases, it was an accretion of power, or an attempt to do so, on the basis of competition for resources. Eventually, since technology itself didn't really allow global accretion of power, these power centers reached the largest geographic extents technology would support, and the global distribution of power geographically settled into a near-perfectly heterogeneous state, with power centers dotted relatively equal distances across the landscape. What we see today is the remnants of that system. Thus, sovereignty in this view is understood to be a product of competition, and is likely still used as a tool to maintain competitive advantages. I will describe the attributes of sovereignty and why it is so desirable both to state actors and domestic populations by painting a broad brush, meaning that I will be describing sovereignty as it has appeared globally. Any one nation may or may not exhibit all of these characteristics. So I'm going to go through all these characteristics. And the first one is states use sovereignty con to control information, particularly, particularly information to their own people. The purpose of this control is to protect and further their ability and capacity to operate outside rule of law, whilst giving the appearance, in some cases, especially in the West, of being its trustworthy exponent. Promoting the us versus them, or the familiar versus the unfamiliar, something reinforced by geographic boundaries established on the basis of sovereignty, which tends to ensure that the majority of the domestic population cannot or does not witness the other side of the dichotomy firsthand. 
Promoting religious adherence, something reinforced by geographic boundaries, established on the basis of sovereignty, which tends to ensure that the majority of the domestic population cannot or does not witness the other side of the dichotomy firsthand. Promoting a particular desirable uh, view of foreign policy, something reinforced by geographic boundaries, established on the basis of sovereignty, which tends to ensure that the majority of the domestic population cannot or does not witness the other side of the, of the dichotomy firsthand. By appealing to nationalism, national security or any other pretext, states can use their supreme sovereignty to explicitly ban the dissemination of information, such as by classifying it as a national secret. By utilizing their sovereign domestic powers in any combination of creative ways to compel a desirable presentation in the public media, especially in the popular press. And by utilizing their sovereign domestic powers in any combination of creative ways to compel business and commerce into supporting the restriction of the free flow of information. So, uh, these first three that I was talking about, um, promoting the us versus them and the religious adherence and the uh, foreign policy and, um, yeah, th those three. The reason why um, I said it that way is because when you have um, sovereignty, you can enforce um, the us versus them. And that kind of includes the whole, the religion and actually the nationalism too, the religion, um, the whole worldview, the foreign policy, and it makes it very hard if you if you can control that and you can keep people from really um, interacting much with people outside of the state, which is what you're doing with, you know, passport requirements and visa requirements and uh, travel restrictions and all this, you um, can control that information better. Um, so that that's what that was about. And then uh, below there when I mentioned um, utilizing cyber domestic powers in any combination of creative ways um, to compel a desirable presentation in the public media. Um, this is this is very common um, here in the states. The, uh, the CIA, you know, they have. Um, it's interesting, but if you look at the Associated Press newswires, for example, um, they have a, a raw feed of these newswires that you know where the stories come out, and you can actually see what the story is, or the, the initial story is when it when it comes out on the wire. And what's interesting is is that. Um, some researchers looked into this, and they found that um, the CIA would call a lot of these, um, um, you know, media outlets and ask them to remove certain things that might, you know, cause problems. Remove information from their from their reporting, especially overseas, that might cause some problems domestically. So, what uh, what they did was they decided to, you know, look at the AP wire, and you can do this too. I mean, you can look at it and see that um, typically they come out with stories, and then they'll um, you know they'll edit them later. They'll correct things and change things. But, but the first raw story, um, you'll see a pattern. You'll see where um, things mentioning the CIA and some of their operations and things like that will appear in that first wire, and then in the next edit, you know, which could be just minutes later or hours later. But in the next edit, you know, that that specific information is removed. And there are many many examples of that. So that's what that's talking about. Um, that's very common. Um, thus, with just first characteristic, w thus with just the first characteristic of sovereignty, we can see how much it can be valued by a state. For to control information is to control reality. In a global governance scheme in which rule of law is so strongly embedded into the system, this will present a considerable hurdle to ratification. Second, this is the second aspect of sovereignty. Sovereignty allows a state to balkanize an economy and control the flow of capital, wealth, and labor. In foreign policy magazine, Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote in Sovereignty that nation states will not disappear, but they will share power with a larger number of powerful non-sovereign actors than ever before, including corporations, non-governmental organizations, terrorist groups, drug cartels, regional and global institutions, and banks and private equity funds. Sovereignty will fall victim to the powerful uh, and accelerating flow of people, ideas, greenhouse gases, goods, dollars, drugs, viruses, emails, and weapons within and across borders. All of this traffic challenges one of the fundamentals of sovereignty, the ability to control what crosses borders. Sovereign states will increasingly, increasingly measure their vulnerability, not to one another, but to forces of globalization beyond their control. Here, Haas was observing an upper layer of a deeper phenomenon. We've discussed it here uh, in the Triffin Dilemma article that, that, uh, that this is referring to the uh, 
K-I-R-K-O-M-R-I-K dot wordpress.com site. There's an article there about the Triffin Dilemma. It's pretty good. Um, we've discussed it here in the Triffin Dilemma article and various economic discussions about one of the few things Karl Marx got right, such as capital accumulation. But basically, sovereignty gives states the power to prevent, for example, removal of capital or wealth from a sovereign's borders, after which point they, can, they will potentially lose that wealth permanently. This can happen deceptively when another state purchases that wealth in a reserve currency the state holds. If continued ad infinitum, the reserve currency state floods the globe with their currency, but eventually depletes the world of all its wealth, accreting all of it within its own sovereign, geographic, or even abstract jurisdiction. For this reason, this sovereign power is critical in the face of such deceptive, but clearly hostile action. Any global governance scheme must ensure no nation of the General Federation can do this. The incidental removal of the need for a reserve currency is a start. Thus the ratification challenge, and that would be about global currency, thus the ratification challenge here lies with convincing the reserve currency nation, which is only one or if considered more broadly three or four, um, this impediment to ratification won't be present for the remainder of the world's governments. The actual physical relocation of persons into an area consequent to the removal of sovereign borders in which the local population holds the newcomer in disdain. This can take on innumerable forms and have just as many causes, but is a fundamental roadblock, a fundamental roadblock in some cases. Security threats that come from other or the unfamiliar, even though security risk always exists in any jurisdiction, this has a significant psychological impact in some areas. Uh, third aspect of sovereignty. Third, in situations of internal competition, states use sovereignty for competitive advantage. In cases factional infighting within a nation, the state can exercise sovereign absolute authority to silence or direct this infighting, even if to do so is clearly a breach of the most basic, obvious human rights. In cases of factional war or civil war within a nation, the state can exercise sovereign absolute authority to silence its opponent at any cost it's willing to pay even if that state is clearly illegitimate. In cases of equity in law, courts can render clearly unjust decisions between factions and conceal the gravamen of the matter within the legal profession. In this case, sovereignty is applied in an overtly corrupt manner to compel judges to rule in a certain manner, either by use of overt bribery or by much more sophisticated subtle influence. As regards culture, states use this to consolidate culture and belief. Any scheme that allows religious and cultural norms or laws to be influenced by other would be considered undesirable in almost any nation. Fourth, in cases of external competition, states use sovereignty to temporarily subordinate the interests of citizens to those of the state, using national security as a power grab. And this one is classic. When an external threat is proffered as a new reality, whether true or not, sovereignty gives the state the ability to respond to this threat by subordinating the interests of those subject to its jurisdiction. States greatly value this benefit. And the fifth uh, aspect of sovereignty, um, and fifth reason why it's so valued by states, <clears throat> is sovereignty is used to merge sovereignty and interdependence by getting some concessions through the use of their sovereignty in other ways and areas as a commodity they can bar bar barter. Excuse me. Yet this is only effective when a world state is created. Hypothetically, at least, a state can grant a loss of sovereignty in exchange for an increase in sovereignty to which they would not otherwise be entitled. So it's like trading one area of sovereignty for another. This has occurred in the European Union, but won't be observed with much frequency until large-scale cooperation becomes a reality. For our purposes, if general federalism competes with disaggregated states or multilateralism, which it will increasingly do, this reality must be taken into account. And the sixth... Um, Sixth reason why uh, sovereignty is so valued by states. In situations of interdependence, some states use sovereignty to reduce it by asserting sovereignty in ways that sets the rules for interdependence with other nations. However, in a globalizing world, this becomes less feasible. In recent history, we've seen this tactic used by the more powerful sovereign actors who simply assert what is and what is not negotiable before discussions begin. The idea here is, as always in the case of sovereign powers, a purely selfish desire to protect one's own interests and gain some cooperation or concession from the other party or parties without having to concede your most important or valued sovereign rights, or in order to violate the sovereign rights of others. The more powerful actors will present these characteristics in their dealings with other, 
and they are sufficiently rare that they can be ignored in the early stages of ratification, at least in terms of ratification itself. And seven, the, um, the last reason why states find sovereignty so valuable. States use sovereignty to manage interdependence, enter the idea of disaggregated states. Here states can use their sovereignty in a kind of international intercourse that is already occurring today to better their position. Having said that, <clears throat> it's a little ironic that one would need to use their sovereignty in concert with a process that undermines their sovereignty. But the very act of asserting sovereignty makes a state's participation in such an intercourse something other stakeholders can take much more seriously than otherwise. It is the mere stature one holds as a sovereign that aids in the intercourse and a state's ability to get a good outcome from it. Regarding this odd irony, Eric Van Veen wrote in The Valuable Tool of Sovereignty, its use in situations of competition and interdependence, that paradoxically using sovereignty as a tool to enter into such further reaching integration projects potentially self-destructs the concept in its classic state definition. Pretty much. Because this kind of multilateral approach is already well underway, it represents both the biggest challenge to open, transparent rule of law and the most dangerous development in world governance thus far. But there is something else salient that we can see from this discussion of sovereignty. A world run by individual sovereign states is backward and barbaric. It's a factory of corruption, war, deceit, and a kind of mindset that must necessarily be backward. The solution to this dilemma is to use what we know works, at least in terms of executing policy. As it is, it's not durable and is dangerous in its present form. But what we allude to here are the disaggregated states, otherwise known as multilateralism, the same thing uh, we've identified in the slaughter fallacy. Um, but the difference, however, is that we're going to put it under the framework of rule of law, where it is publicly known. The actors are named and known to the public. It is accountable, and it has a constitutional basis. Not only is the idea to entice ratification, it is designed to improve on durability long term, while not compromising the principles of general federalism. The tool used is called a national codicil to a social contract, known as an equitable instrument, and an option given to any state that joins the union but is still uncomfortable with being subjected to its laws. What this instrument does is says that instead of laws uh, of the federation being immutable and stayed, these laws and the laws of the national codicil can, case by case, be reconciled using principles of equity and law. This turns the whole process uh, for a sunset period of 50 years from ratification into a giant process of negotiation, persuasion, influence, etc. And after that ratification, um, the laws of the Federation are final and can be appealed only in the federal system. The difference, however, is that the party doing it is the Federation's civil core. And this is what's different from the slaughter fallacy. Not a bunch of nameless hidden cowboys of various professions and trades whose qualifications are sketchy at best. Over the provisional period of 50 years, the job, in the, the job of the core is to move the state closer and closer to full compliance with federation law. This single provision almost completely wipes out all the objections above because it gives the wary state full access to the law and a full opportunity to at least compromise laws about to be enforced in its jurisdiction. Other concerns deal with the substantive rights of Article 7, which is more of an individual rights issue that might not well be defended by a national codicil. Therefore, an explicit provision is provided to make it a hurdle, but an easy enough thing to do to demand the original jurisdiction of the Federation and halt state proceedings if substantive rights are violated. And it aligns itself with the natural evolution already occurring in multilateralism today, and merely puts a process of rule of law around it to ensure that it matures as we want and expect it to. So that concludes that, and that's how, you, you know, this is, that's sort of the general Federalist program for how you would deal with um, this strong sale of sovereignty. Um, basically, you remove um, all the all the concerns that they would have about what they would lose, um, and that's sort of the scheme of, of how um, it's proposed to be done, very uh, loosely. So the next section then is uh, zero zero banking, and uh, it's kind of funny. This is the last part because it's it's really key to the whole thing, and very central to everything. Um, saving what is arguably the most important for last. What kind of institutional architecture does one apply to facilitate monetary policy? We examined various systems of monetary policy and found that every one of them was based on some very old, outdated models. Given that this topic is the least well understood amongst the general public, we will need to start with some background. First, it is important to understand the basic history of banking. 
and this is very basic. Um, bank, banks began a few hundred years ago, and the modern banking systems descend from their predecessors in Europe when capitalists, or those holding sufficient capital, decided that they could loan money to others and profit by requiring repayment of the premium with interest added. In that environment, the political powers that existed enforced this scheme, making it a viable business model. Bank, banks began to take deposits of wealth from their customers, in the form of gold, for example, and would write a note that they designed and printed which basically promised and affirmed that the customer had the amount of gold on deposit at the bank that wrote the note. This is very much analogous to what we were talking about earlier about um, this community that agrees to um, you know, hold everyone accountable for the natural resources and then starts writing notes to disentangle the um, inherent labor from the capital. Um, it's the same thing, um, but in this case, the wealth that the notes were based on, uh, or based on in the, um, in the example before, is the inherent labor. <clears throat> when this first started, they based it on um, more visible wealth, um, wealth that was, um, you know, I, I guess more reified. But gold was a very, very um, easy way to do it because uh, it, you could you could have a lot of wealth um, in a very small confined space. It's, heavy, but I mean an ingot of gold is worth quite a bit. So it's very compact, very easy to transport, and very easy to exchange um, in bartering for, for, uh, for other goods, for other wealth. So, and this is important to point out because this is where a lot of the confusion about the gold standard and stuff comes in. The gold, the gold standard existed because gold is, has that history. Um, it started out a very long time ago being just one form of, you know, virtually an infinite number of forms of wealth. It's just another form of wealth. It's a rare, um, it's a rare element. So um, it's valuable. But what's handy and useful about it is, is its compactness. It's the, the, the ease with which you can use it as an exchange mechanism. That's why it was used. So the point here um, of gold and what was what's missed by a lot of the uh, the, the gold standard people um, is that people that, that advocate gold standards is that gold is just another form of wealth. Currency is backed to wealth, and it's the wealth that matters. It doesn't matter what form it's in; it matters that it is wealth. There is some argument, though, in saying that when you have a currency abstractly tied to wealth, and that that connection is abstract, then there can be some risk there. And we'll get into that. We'll talk about that some more, but. The same thing could happen with gold. You could abstract that connection too, but generally it wasn't. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to put that out there and clear that up so that um, everyone understood what, uh, why gold even got used in the first place. Why, why was it? You know, why did they even bother to do that? And, and that's why. It was rare, so it was very valuable, and it was an element on the periodic table that happened to be very dense, and you could, you know, make it, you know, very small, and it'd still be worth a lot. So in this way, the customer could carry around notes, which is much easier to transport and use, even more easier than even easier than gold, and exchange it for other forms of wealth, allowing them to buy products and services on the open market. So, like the inherent labor, with these notes, they can use the the power of that wealth <coughs> in the market and exchange it readily, um, in, in in trade. The fundamental shift and change here was that instead of having to exchange or barter wealth for wealth directly like by trading gold for lumber to build a house, one could use an abstract general vehicle for exchange in the form of these banknotes. Banknotes would later evolve into modern currency, but the idea is the same. If someone selling lumber to someone bearing and offering banknotes in return, this exchange is called valuable consideration because both parties considered something of value to each of them and agreed to make the exchange. When the person selling the lumber takes the bank notes, he can use them again with someone else, or he can visit that bank and demand the gold that it promises. So again, it, it commands the wealth that it represents, uh, legally, by rule of law. It's legally tender. Another service these deposit holders, these early bankers, could offer was to loan money to customers with, as we said, a requirement to repay with interest. This would be done by printing notes representing the full amount of the loan requested and would, on that bank's reputation, faith and credit, represent wealth on deposit, such as in the form of gold, that they actually owned themselves, not someone else's deposits. And this made sense because it was the bank loaning the money, and it is they who should be able to back their own notes. 
It is key to understand that at that time, the likelihood of several note holders coming back to the bank on or about the same time and demanding all of their gold was highly unlikely. In that age, technology limited transportation and communication, and a bank 30 miles away was a great distance indeed. It took considerable effort to go visit a bank, especially ones well over 30 miles away. And communication with them and the communication of news generally was very slow by modern standards. Additionally, in the case of loans, poverty was so severe and so prolific and wealth so tight, with the terms of loans so onerous, that the likelihood of a large number of people paying off their loans at once was astronomically slim. So these nascent bank owners took advantage of this by realizing a mathematical quirk. Because for practical intents and purposes, in that day and age, it was essentially impossible for the deposits to all be demanded at once. Thus the rule regarding backing the loaning money in the form of simply printing extra notes with actual deposits you own on hand could be manipulated and basically, to some degree, ignored. To explain, suppose I hold $1,000 worth of gold on deposit from customers. None of this gold is actually mine, and I've written notes for all of them promising that I have this on deposit and can honor each of those notes on demand. But suppose I decide that, since it is really impossible for all these notes to be brought up and all gold they represent to be demanded at the same time, I will loan out half of those gold deposits to additional customers. Now I am writing notes and giving them to the new customers, which, like the other notes, promise that I will produce the gold they supposedly represent. But in reality, I am now claiming to be able to pay out $1,500 worth of gold. This I cannot do because I don't have it. But if I cannot do something that is impossible anyway, what's the harm? If you can't make the demand, then I don't need to honor it. It's a false demand. This is where this originated. This is a, a fractional scheme. We're going to talk about this some more, but this is where the whole idea of a fractional scheme originated, back when it was technologically impossible for it to make any difference. Now let's suppose that someday we no longer use gold or tangible wealth to back these notes. And we just use yet more cash as the backing for deposits and loans. Furthermore, let's say that a government comes along and says, this is a great scheme you have going, but obviously <clears throat> you can only carry this so far. We're going to set a limit on how much currency, notes, you can loan out relative to what you actually have on deposit. Suppose they pick a number of around 10%. Thus in, this, thus in the example given, it would mean that the banker could loan out $10,000 in notes for every $1,000 worth of gold he or she truly physically had on deposit. Since it's virtually impossible for an instant demand for $10,000 from the banker's reserves to be made in that day and age, there is really no reason for the banker to guarantee his or her ability to pay that much at once. This will all be true unless and until the technological infrastructure changes and the impediments to transportation, communication, and terms of loans become less severe. Why would a government, even if the impediments aforementioned were strong, want to allow this kind of leveraged loaning? The answer is simple. An economy that allows this kind of leveraged loaning grows much, much faster. Think about it. If banks can loan out $10,000 in currency for only $1,000 of reserve, they can enable entrepreneurs and other job creators to do that much more than they could if they could only loan out $1,000 of notes. It's like 10 times the job creation, basically, um, both in amount and rate. For this reason, this scheme of monetary policy and banking became popular during the, indu during the Industrial Revolution, becoming known as fractional reserve banking. I don't know if England started it, but uh, they created the Bank of England, um, and it started, um, I think it did start in England, but th this was a long time ago. They had a fractional reserve banking scheme, um, and there was controversy about that at the time. Um, a lot of people didn't believe in that, didn't think that was right, but uh, you know, morally or ethically right. But um, they went ahead and did it, um, and uh, that's as far as I know, that's where it was born. But anyway, it is called fractional because banks are only required to maintain a fraction of reserves for what they loan out. In the United States, in the vast majority of cases, that limit is ten percent. The problem, however, is that this system begins to slip outside any framework of rule of law. You can place it around it when these aforementioned impediments begin to weaken and become less of an issue. Rule of law comes into play here because any rule of law that protects private property and provides remedy for theft can no longer guarantee that, 
wherever it becomes physically possible to demand these reserves, that those entitled to them will be able to get them. And it must be able to do that if it's going to be rule of law. If they cannot, because this system was deliberately constructed this way, it would constitute theft by taking whereby no rule of law in that scenario would exist. There is no remedy because the traditional law presumably would not assume that this is theft by taking. There is no law, no rule of law, on the books to deal with this for what it truly is. This is a very important point. <clears throat> point. Um, but just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and this is just a theoretical problem. Um, but the real serious problems are still to be exposed. Consider what happens when governments decide that they will start printing these notes. This is a good thing because it standardizes the notes and makes them much more versatile and generally usable. But it does generate a slight problem. If the government prints this currency, how will it get it into circulation? In order to do that, it needs banks. But here is where urban legend, public myth, and a general void of understanding of economics and finance wreaks havoc on the popular understanding of monetary policy, evidenced by the innumerable YouTube videos on the subject. Um, it, is a key, it is key and vital to understand at this point that currency and wealth are two completely different things. They're not the same. And while a lot of people you know, will say, yeah, I know that, I understand that, but then they'll go on to, to, to you know, describe something where it doesn't sound like they are making any distinction between them. So a lot of videos on YouTube you know, that talk about, that bemoan the existence of the fractional reserve uh, you know, or, or the um, Federal Reserve banking system, uh, you know, just go off on this, um, uh, conflating uh, currency and wealth and confusing them and uh, making assumptions about printing money out of thin air because they've confused currency and wealth. Um, but we'll get into that. But it's, it's, that's why it's important to understand this. So there really is something important to be found here. It's not that they're not seeing something significant, but um, they're, they're kind of um, missing the point and not seeing the full picture. So currency is merely and solely a metric, a measuring stick for measuring actual real wealth. So currency is like a, you know, it's like a, yeah, it's like a, like a meter stick, um, you know, that you use to measure distance. Uh, this just measures wealth. Wealth is anything that could be considered of value to anyone in the marketplace. Anything, regardless of what it is, including gold. Um, gold is a form of wealth, a representation, a tangible representation of wealth. Thus, currency is just a tool used to facilitate the trading of wealth. It just makes it easier. You don't have to carry around all the gold or, or, or other wealth. You don't have to carry that around with you. You can just carry currency. While many will nod their heads in agreement to this, it is clear that they still don't quite understand the full implication of this when they claim that, for example, the U.S. Federal Reserve prints money out of thin air. <laughs> this is grossly false. Therefore, we need to clear the air on these public myths before proceeding. A government that decides to take on the task of printing or minting currency for use throughout its jurisdiction must do several things. First, it must enact law that demands, under penalty of legal remedy, that this currency be the only currency, and that it be accepted on demand, that it be legal tender. If it does not do this, not only can others mint their own money and refuse to acknowledge the government's money, it means that if other currencies are circulating, sound monetary policy becomes impossible because you cannot influence extra legal currencies. Um, Remember that rule of law is what enforces your right to use notes or currency to employ the power of the wealth it represents. Only by having a rule that says you have to do that. See, because there's nothing that physically makes it. I mean, it's, it's just an abstract connection between the currency and the wealth. So in order to f enforce that and make everyone honor and respect the power of that wealth that it represents, you have to have rule of law and law that says when this money is produced, you must honor it um, as, as if it were that wealth. So, or as if it were, you know, wealth equivalent to that. Um, and that's, that's rule of law, and that's what legal tender is, and you have to do that. A currency that's not backed by rule of law is weak. It's going to have problems, um, ask the European Union. So, it means that if other currencies are circulating, sound money, yeah, we said that. But this problem runs yet deeper, and a brief aside is needed to explain how. 
Recalling that currency represents wealth. One can easily grasp economics even at the global scale by understanding and following the mantra that currency chases wealth, not the reverse. Therefore, in a stable, healthy economy, all currency in circulation within a jurisdiction, economists call this M1 and M2 and M3, but I mean, it's M something. Um, it depends on what, how you're counting it, but um, economists call it M1. This is the total currency in circulation. Um, therefore, in a stable, healthy economy, M1 should accurately reflect all wealth under the auspices of that jurisdiction. Now, this is kind of a, a kind of a clean explanation because it, it can get much uglier than this, but that's basically the logic behind it. This is absolutely vital to understand, and whether or not it is accurate uh, is based on how the market esteems value, making this calculation very hard to perform. So if some other currency is out there and no law exists to give the government's currency the full faith and credit of rule of law, backed by law, then it means that the nation's wealth is not fully denominated in the government's currency. Thus, any monetary policy will only have a partial, perhaps balkanized effect on the economy. So this is unacceptable. Imagine trying to get a country out of a financial crisis when you realize because of all these currencies, or because not all states recognize the currency as legal tender, you cannot address the crisis because basically you don't have adequate control of the currency circulating in your, quote, country. Um, and, and this would be the case where a state does not recognize the full authority of federal or central law. The problem of the, Europe, the European Union is facing the same thing. Just mentioned. Um, this is a simplified explanation of what is going on, but the reality tracks the ideal quite well. Therefore, rule of law backing a single currency with the full faith and credit of the regnant government is absolutely essential for a stable, durable economic system to exist. The second thing that government, government must figure out, as already noted, is how to get this currency in circulation without destabilizing or harming the economy. It will be helpful to first demonstrate how the United States solved this problem. So we can now return to our discussion of the case of the Federal Reserve System. Here there are 12 reserve banks scattered about the United States. The Federal Reserve is itself a private entity to whom Congress uh, has farmed out its minting job. So when the Federal Reserve mints new currency, it first deposits it in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is, one, the, which is the one Federal Reserve Bank designated for that purpose. Then the United States government will offer the Federal Reserve financial instruments that denominate the aggregate wealth of the United States, both at present and as a future speculated value. In exchange, the Federal Reserve pays for this using the newly minted currency by depositing that newly minted currency from the Federal Reserve Bank in New York to United States government private bank accounts. Let's back up here. This is very important. So when the Federal Reserve mints new currency, it first deposits it into the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is the one Federal Reserve Bank designated for that purpose. Then the United States government will offer the Federal Reserve financial instruments, will offer the Federal Reserve financial instruments valuable consideration, that denominate the aggregate wealth of the United States, both at present and as a future speculated value. So the United States, acting as the legal personality of the United States, offers in valuable consideration the aggregate wealth of the United States, present and future, as a speculated fractional value. It's a fraction of it. Um, so the Federal Reserve is printing money um, invaluable consideration of that wealth. So what's actually happening is money's not being printed out of thin air. Um, that, that currency represents genuine wealth. But what's happening is, the, there is a problem here though. And the problem is, is that the Federal Reserve is essentially um, buying the wealth of the United States. It doesn't buy all the bonds, but it, it is buying a portion of the wealth of the United States. And that is a problem, because it's a kind of a um, uh, kind of a sketchy organization. Um, so, uh, let's see where we're at. Yeah, and this is called valuable consideration. It has nothing to do with paying money out of thin air. Typically, the instrument sold is a U.S. government bond. Bonds are financial instruments that constitute a fractional metric, just like currency, but which includes speculative future value metrics of wealth. So it's like currency with speculation added. Here, also called debt. In other words, the United States government is selling national wealth and being paid for it in return. This is called monetizing debt. The payment in newly minted currency mostly pays for the speculative value of national wealth believed to be imminently created after the print run. Why? 
because that is what the print run is all about. Recalling that currency chases wealth. If the aggregate wealth within a jurisdiction increases over some time interval, call it T, then in order for the economy to remain stable and for the total currency in circulation to accurately reflect the market's perception of what that wealth is worth, the total currency in circulation uh, sometime during T must increase by a proportionate amount. Let us repeat that. Currency chases wealth. So the old wives tell of the impropriety of printing money is nonsense, and it usually begins by fixating on the phrase monetizing debt, and reflects a complete misunderstanding of what that actually means. So, just a warning. And this disinformation is being broadcast all over the internet, and it is a disturbingly deep misunderstanding of what is going on. It is such a popular myth um, that even prominent uh, public figures have come to believe it um, and spread the falsehood. Persons like Ron Paul, uh, G. Edward Griffith, and Pat Buchanan continue to spread this falsehood. What matters is how much currency is printed, and thus how much debt is monetized, not the mere fact that debt is being monetized. Governments must print money because if they don't, and as aggregate wealth increases, which it almost always does in the United States, you will create deflation of the dollar. Let us explain what we mean about how money should be printed. Suppose, in this greatly simplified example, the entire currency in circulation in this country is just $100. And we begin with a condition in which the market believes, this is better stated as when they engage in exchange in the market, their behavior indicates this belief, that all aggregate wealth in their country is worth $100. Fiscal policy is balanced at this point. You have $100 uh, uh, of metric, $100 of currency, and $100 of wealth. So the metric matches the currency. You are measuring the wealth. You are tracking the wealth accurately. Now, suppose the government decides to print $100 more. But suppose that the wealth never changed. That is, the same stuff is there. And nothing new has been created, nor did the wealth already there depreciate. This means that we now have $200 acting as the metric for $100 worth of wealth. This necessarily means that it now takes $2 to accurately measure the wealth of that one dollar used to act, used to accurately measure. This is called inflation because the dollar is now worth only half what it was before. It takes twice the money to buy the same thing as before. Conversely, if we remove fifty dollars from circulation, reduce M1 by fifty dollars, then the wealth once accurately measured by one dollar now requires only fifty cents to accurately measure. Thus the dollar is now quote worth twice what it was. This is called deflation and it takes only half as much money to buy the same thing as before. The holy grail of fiscal policy in the United States since the founding of national banks, uh, like the Federal Reserve, has been how to know uh, and accurately print the right amount of currency at the right time to match changes in wealth. This is the key to understanding fiscal policy in the United States and in most other countries. Recalling that currency chases wealth, monetary policy is all about figuring out how much money should be in circulation, which by indirection is a game of assessing and tracking aggregate wealth. What the metrics for? Currency. So the United States solved this problem in its case by creating a private institution in 1913 uh, that would in reality primarily be tasked with advancing the state of the art in tracking wealth. Not just in the simple examples we've discussed here, but aggregate wealth as found within specific industries, nationally, internationally, by country, etc. You know, but by all kind, you know, it's, it's broken down in great detail. After about 100 years of doing this, they have honed this art to a science, and they are very good at it. The scheme of printing money and selling speculative national wealth, which, by the way, a private entity is buying up, continues by taking the proceeds from that transaction which end up in private government bank accounts, and pumping it into the economy through the only means a government can move money into the private sector. Government budget spending. But let's be clear. Governments collect revenue from the population. That's money that's already in circulation. So how are they going to, do, how are they going to pump new currency into, the, into the, in circulation um, if they're receiving revenue for the spending? Well, the answer is, is the only way to do that is to um, run, a de run a deficit. Um, so now we know the rest of the story. Um, 
when the Bretton Woods Agreement um, came apart in the early '70s and they went off the gold standard, um, they had to start um, they had to start um, circulating currency pretty um, aggressively, and uh, the only way they could do that was to run deficits, and that's why the deficits went nuts uh, in the '70s and had never have never looked back. It's because they had to get that currency in circulation, the, the new currency that had been produced by the Federal Reserve. So um, now we can more clearly see the connection between government spending and rapid increases in national wealth. As national wealth increases, government budgetary expenditures must also increase. That is, the pipe through which currency is being channeled into the private sector has to get fatter. Why is this? Because recalling that currency chases wealth, Whenever the Federal Reserve performs a speculative, large print run, the total currency in circulation will, while it is making its way throughout the economy and reaching its final endpoint, be disproportionately, disproportionately larger than the aggregate wealth it represents. Therefore, this currency must move quickly into the private sector and be quickly converted into new wealth. So you're printing this currency, but it's, it's speculative. So you're creating more currency than there really is wealth at that moment. But when that currency is circulated, it will produce that wealth that you've predicted it will produce. But there is a time lag. So that is done by uh, the bank loans, aforementioned, made to entrepreneurs to other creators of wealth. Um, that's how they, they get that out there and that wealth gets created. Entrepreneurs borrowing that money. During the time it takes to circulate this currency, call it T, significant inflationary pressure is felt. But in order for inflation to take hold, it takes some time. As long as you can get this currency circulated all the way to the point where it is converted to new wealth faster than it takes inflation to take hold, and if the amount you printed is accurately converted to new wealth and reflects all the new wealth created in the immediate past before your print run, you will not see a significant rise in inflation. Currency matches wealth. As you can see, the monetary policymakers are playing a constant game of print, observe, then print again. They print currency and see how far off they are. Then they adjust the next print by taking that into account. Returning to our question, government budget spending in this scheme ultimately becomes unsustainable if the rate at which wealth is being created is too high. This has implications for globalization because the government spending pipe has to be larger than is financially feasible in order to move large amounts of currency quickly to avoid inflationary catastrophe. This, is, this has to do with, with globalization and what we've seen recently uh, um, with you know, Bernanke et al.'s um, monetizing of debt, these massive print runs. Keep in mind that the spending we are talking about here is not from the simple recirculation of revenue, since that is the spending of currency already in circulation. We mentioned that. The kind of spending required is deficit spending, and uh, that would have been true since the gold standard was removed in the early 70s. So this is the real, quote, secret reason and it is a secret, um, or yeah, it's a pretty good one, that toilet seats cost, you know, $500. Um, that, that also plays a role in it, um, just the fact that, that, that prices are inflated. But this is also due to faction and special interest, too. These are kickbacks is what they are. So special interest says, um, you know, we'd like to sell toilet seats to you, um, but let's make them $500 um, a piece so that you can pay us for us getting you in office. Um, that's the kind of bribery and corruption that's going on. That, that's why stuff costs so much that and this. And it is indeed secret because those that understand this stuff don't talk about it because so many obvious unpleasant conclusions will spill out at once. Thus the unfortunate irony and weakness of the system is that the more prosperous the economy becomes and the bigger it gets, the more government spending is required. This is unsustainable if we purpose to devise an economic system whose, whose growth is unbound. Once again, rule of law comes into play. If the federal budget is beholden to an arbitrary arbitrary from its perspective, mechanism for managing fiscal policy, then there is no guarantee that rule of law will be followed faithfully when actions are controlled by external economic factors deliberately put in place. Finally, we can more clearly see what happens if we remove some very old assumptions. Notice that this particular fractional reserve banking scheme is based on assumptions that are technologically grounded. 300 years ago, there really was no other way to do this, at least not any way that worked well. And remember, of course, too, the issue of, you know, the impossibility of, um, of being able to um, call on all these loans at, at once. Having to use banks as the vehicle to mint currency and distribute it was a necessary evil. 
Using fractional rules was a necessary evil to make economic engines churn. Um, Hamilton was a Alexander Hamilton was a big fan of that, um, and he wanted he wanted a Federal Reserve or, or a national bank um, back when um, back in his time. And I mean, it, it, they didn't get it, or they didn't get a permanent one until 1913. Meanwhile, bankers made unbelievable profits from the system. Banks are basically institutions skimming off the top of national wealth creation. That's what they're doing. So all of this interest they're gathering, all of this um, bank they're making, no pun intended, um, is coming from wealth creation, and it's skimming off the top because a lot we're going to see in a minute where all that, well, we have seen actually, where all that wealth comes from. Um, a big chunk of it is inherited labor. So the banks are, are sucking up a lot of wealth of other people. So keeping in mind that the point of this operation is to mint and distribute currency such that it matches existing aggregate wealth as accurately as possible, it is useful now to ask if there is a simpler, more just way of doing this that does not undermine rule of law. And the answer is refreshingly simple and obvious once you digest it. The same process of assessing how much currency to print based on an assessment of new wealth both recently and about to be generated in the macroscopic style in which it is done can also be done microscopically with much greater effect if you have the technology, if you have the computer software to track all of this and, and to, to keep track of it. But to do this requires modern technology not available to bankers even 50 years ago. The solution is to make these assessments, these measurements of wealth, individually, minting a specific amount of currency to match a specific new wealth generation proposal, uh, and also in uh, in the uh, individual financial productivity we were talking about earlier. Thus a new enterprise is proposed and just as one does with a bank, a risk and actuarial analysis is conducted to determine the likelihood of both new wealth generation immediately and new wealth generation long term. If the risk is market tolerable and if it is rendered uh, actuarially profitable, there is no reason why a minting authority cannot simply print the currency needed to start the enterprise with no need to repay the principal or repay it with interest. It, in effect, requires zero reserves and requires zero repayment, making it incredibly aggressive as the kind of economic engine Alexander Hamilton dreamed of when he thought about fractional reserve banking. And if you think about this, this follows, because what's happening when they print the currency in the, in the existing system is that the currency is representing new wealth generation. That's the whole point of the print. It represents new wealth in the nation macroscopically. And some of it is speculative. This is the bonds where we're talking about. So this currency is being used to, to measure, to represent new wealth. So there really is no reason to loan the money to someone or to some enterprise that is creating that new wealth. Um, that doesn't make any sense, uh, unless you're a bank. If you're a bank, you can loan the money and... Uh, on top of the fact that you know this this enterprise you're loaning it for um, is is creating the wealth that that money represents anyway, but you can loan it to them and, and also charge interest. Um, <clears throat> this is completely unnecessary. You don't need to do this uh, at a microscopic level. So um, let's see. I just went in this bank. Yes, and I forget where I was. Okay, in effect requires zero reserve. Yeah, there it is. If there ever were something they didn't want you to know, it is this. When you really understand how you know how this works, it really it really isn't that complicated. It's it's fairly simple when you get your head around it. Um, yes, in practice it gets very complicated, but in terms of, of the theoretical basis of what's going on, it's not that complicated. I mean, this all currency is is, is a tool is a metric for measuring wealth, and as long as you can match the currency to the wealth, you're okay. It's actuarially a sound. A multi-billion dollar industry would be totally without justification and exposed as a Ponzi scheme overnight if those that understand this stuff were to talk about this. Um, most people I know, everyone I know who knows this doesn't talk about it, so there you go. Uh, I'm the only idiot. So the solution here provided is a mirrored parallel of what is done in the United States today. The only difference being that the math of monetary policy is done per enterprise, not in mass. We call it zero-zero banking, even though there are really no banks in such a system. Um, there, is a, there is a national bank in a sense, but um, we're also running out of time. So, 
Um, th there is the drawback. I did mention the possibility of a drawback, and um, you know, uh, really, there's not. I mean, I did mention you know the capital accumulation and the Triffin dilemma, um, but really, that that pretty much wraps up this section. Um, let's see. Um, I talked about the trip. You, you can go to that website. I mentioned that. You can go read about the trip. You should read about that. It's, it's an excellent story. Um, so, let's see that. And, and I think I think that covers most of it. Um, there's um, why the USSR, the economy of the USSR collapsed. It had to do with capital and the misuse of capital. That was the primary reason. Um, and and that, that's really it. So. Um, a lot of people think you know it was because of you know they lacked financial productivity, which is probably true. But there are a lot of other theories, that, especially capitals throughout. But really, what it came down to was just misuse of, of capital. They didn't use; um, they produced more capital than the United States did. It was actually stupendously successful in some ways. But um, they didn't use the capital productively. Was the problem? So they didn't recirculate it back into productive roles. So um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, um, I think that that will conclude the section. So I, mean, I think we're done. So um, the next one, uh, part seven, is going to be about um, something more activist related, having to do with all this, and that'll be very interesting. So we'll see you then.